I, I guess a healthy self appraisal, another word would be modest. Yeah. Like we don't assume more of ourselves than we're capable of, but we also don't assume less of ourselves. And this is an area of self awareness where people oftentimes do fail because they're not acknowledging how hard on themselves they are. I think we almost all tend to, not everybody, but most of us tend to have a lower self appraisal than we're than we probably have earned. Hi, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. So yesterday, Antonia, we, it was my birthday at the time of this recording, and I took our whole family to do something for my birthday. I took us up into the treetops to go zip lining and high ropes coursing, and I don't know what the yes. verbs are for all of these Obstacle things. Obstacle course, I believe Obstacle is what they coursing. called it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was really fun, mm. but I made a little bit of a miscalculation because I, when we first go in, there's different levels. There's like a bot. There's basically three levels. There's like a no. basic. No, no, no. I mean, there's like five, six, five levels. levels. Five levels. There okay. was five levels. Thank you for bringing accuracy in yeah. for, for thinking in here. For the story, sake of my story, we don't need to do all five, but I think for the sake of what you're going to ping back to me, we yeah. do. Yeah. So I'll, I'll buy your framework. Okay. Uh, so five levels, you know, beginner. Mm-hmm all the way up to what they call Black Diamond, kind of like a skiing term. And they were like way up in the treetops, very difficult challenges, and you're roped in the very top. I thought, you know what? Let's start at like the second tier down from the most advanced. I think everybody in the family, you, me, all the kids, their friends, we can all handle this. Uh, but that was pretty tough on you. You actually had to leave halfway through the I, experience. I believe the phrase is punked out. <laughs> I punked out halfway through when we got up there. They called the K2, by the way. It's yes. not like it's not like just the second last. And the reason why it's relevant that there are five different levels is yeah, each tell me. Le- tell me why that's relevant. Because each level is 10 feet higher. Mm. The first level is at the 10 foot. The second level is at the 20 foot. I, I didn't catch that detail. You didn't you didn't notice that? I, I was that. just having fun. I'm not like paying attention to notes so or we signage. Went, yeah, we went on the fourth and each one is progressively more difficult and complicated. Okay. So the fourth level up was 40 feet into the air. And even though you're in a, you're, you're cable, you know, you're strapped into the cable and you're not going anywhere. You're all harnessed up. You can just kind of swing there for a while and yeah. like not know what to do and try to save yourself to get back onto whatever tiny little piece of rickety wood that you're meant to walk on, right? That's twisting and turning and swinging and I all that stuff. I thought you did great. Yeah, thanks. So uh, it was terrifying. I'm already afraid of heights. I, I go do everything. I try to do things I'm terrified of at least once. Yeah. Just to, um, well, number one, to get a healthy amount of eustress into my diet, right? Because yeah. I knew I wasn't going to die. The animal in me was pretty sure death was on its way. But the my neocortex was pretty sure that those cables were, I mean, it didn't seem like anybody else was falling from the tree, so I was probably going to be all right. So I knew I wasn't going to die. And so yeah. I had a healthy amount of eustress, but it was extremely challenging. And uh, yeah, I, halfway through, there's like this escape valve. And I was like, I shall be taking that. And then I just spent the rest of the afternoon ziplining, which yeah. was awesome, by the way. Ziplining is super fun. But I'm just, I'm short- uh, I would say that I'm losing my balance as I'm aging. I yes. used to do yoga all the time. I've done yoga in a while. So I'm like, well, maybe, maybe it's time to go back and start doing yoga and get my balance back. But I just, I mean, I knew that I look ridiculous trying to, I mean, these things are like, <laughs> like spinning logs that yes. require you to jump from one spinning log to another spinning log in and they're like they're in swinging. midair while they're swinging. Right. Yeah. It was just, yeah, it was a lot. W- why are we bringing this up again? Oh. <laughs> Just to traumatize you again. That's the only reason. Just to relive the experience. Well, for two reasons. Yeah. One, well, let me just say the rest of it. I, it was a great experience. And myself, my son and I, Gunner, he's 18. We went up to the very top, the Black Diamond. And I wish you could have done that because that was, I mean, it's really intense, but it's also fun. I wish like gyms were set up this way. It'd be more all, fun to go to the gym. All one of you is wishes I would have done that. Anywho, so there, there's two reasons I bring this up. One I'm happy you had this experience because, you know, one of the things that we do because not up <laughs> well with our personality life path mentorship program. Yeah, week number one. Yes, because we go through eight weeks all the cognitive functions of personality. We we talk about how your relationship in your life relates to this function. Yeah, and week number one is extroverted sensing sensation. We start with the sensing functions and we work up from there. We end mm-hmm. with intuition over eight weeks live event at the end, right? Where we connect it for your, a person's life. But week one. 
we have a lot of INJs that end up in our program mm-hmm. and other types too. Yeah. And it could be a similar recommendation. One of the recommendations that we make, because we pick an exercise for everyone, at least one, for them to go tune to that energy every week. And week one, you have assigned zip lines and ropes courses in the air to people. So uh-huh. I think it's good. You have an empathy or sympathy, whichever word I'm supposed to use there, for people being up in the trees mm-hmm. for the very thing you assign them. Yes. I Now I, you know what it's like. To be fair, I've only ever assigned zip lining. Yes. And and I, you know, I hadn't really done it before. And so I'm glad I did. And it was a total blast. And I'm, I, I would go like oh, yeah. on pretty intense ones. I'm yes. pretty sure. Yeah. Yes. I would zip line just about anywhere at this point. Uh, ropes courses though, that require coordination and body strength and upper body strength and core strength and all those things that I'm currently lacking well, and yes. trying to get back, but am not in the middle of like really having dialed in. Uh, yeah, that was, uh, I don't know if I'll, I, if somebody's like, I, I kind of failed and punked out, I'll be like, as did I. <laughs> well, maybe somebody more advanced. Maybe there's an extroverted sensing sensation user that would be useful for not just the zip lining. You right. need to go to the higher levels, mm-hmm. like go to more advanced stuff. So you have more nuance for this. So I think it's good. Yeah. Well, and we did have uh, a couple of uh, personality life path mentorships ago. We had um, somebody with ESTP preferences. His name is Jimmy. And actually, yes. while I was doing it, I was like, I, I, I actually thought, I bet Jimmy would love this. He would love that. <laughs> and he would have oh, been through it gosh. so fast. Yeah, Yeah. we did like night walking at the PLP. He was showing me like, just don't use any artificial light and your eyes will adjust and we were doing it in the woods. It was great. Yeah. Okay. The second reason I brought it up is it kind of relates to what I want to talk about today. This idea of assessment Mm. and prejudgment, like kind of determining how a person's going to be. Now, I wasn't assessing myself, but I was assessing you. I was trying to appraise how you were going to do on this course. And so I thought, yeah, I think we can all handle this level. Clearly, I didn't pay attention to detail. You may have overshot. I didn't choose. I should have worked (laughs) ourselves up. We only had a few hours. So I was like trying to make the fun all happen and Mm -hmm. push it. Uh, So I kind of appraised the situation a little wonky. Mm -hmm. And as we talk about today, we're going to talk about appraisals. We're going to tune in not to appraising a situation or other other people necessarily, but to the self. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of a form of, I would say, Mm self-awareness. And I think, so one of the things that I am always surprised about is how many people would report high levels of self-awareness. I think most people believe they're very good at assessing the self and being Mm self-aware. I think I'm good at it. I think I'm excellent at it. And I know that I'm not as good as I probably think I am. Mm. I don't know how you feel about that. Do you feel like you're pretty good at self-assessment or is it something that you struggle with in a general sense? Uh, Self-assessment as a, oh, uh, self-awareness, self-assessment, or self-appraisal? All three. Okay. You feel, I think people gl- group them together, first of all. They don't make distinction around any of that. I think we're going to try to do that today a little bit. Yeah. And then they just give themselves a high score. I think that self-awareness is, uh, it falls under a similar category of relationships or parenting. Yeah. I think everybody thinks we're naturally good at them. And we don't usually reach out for help until a lack of being good at it is creating a major problem. So bad. Yeah. Like, when do we go visit a marriage counselor when we're two minutes from divorce? When do we go visit, like, a a parenting expert when our teenager is imploding? Like, that's usually when we do that. And when do we seek self, you know, self-improvement materials? Usually when we're in kind of a bad way and we need them. Yeah. So I think self uh, awareness is something that almost everybody claims. And that makes sense because we're only aware of what we're aware of. Yeah. And since we're inside of ourselves, it means that we're aware of a, of a you know, a certain percentage, a certain yeah. amount. And if that's all we're paying attention to and we don't know that there's more available, more territory available, it, makes, it would make sense that we would say, I'm good, you know, like I have a lot of self-awareness. Yeah, actually, okay, that actually adds a, a, a layer of fidelity to it. So we could start start to see it then as not, binary like i'm aware of myself or i'm not it's to what degree yes and maybe there's levels that we can access we appraise and we are aware i mean i think this comes from we do a lot of coaching like i mentioned at the beginning of the show with injs in our programs and all this i can't tell you how many let's just pick a person i type and let me use this as a starting a launching place for the conversation today I can't tell you how many INTJs we run into or talk with in our coaching and our just live events or whatever we're doing that will report attempting to project how they will feel at a future date or event. They'll say, hey, you want to go do this or you want to go do that activity two weeks from now. And they will say, they'll kind of run the simulation of maybe their emotions and what they expect their emotions to be at that event or that 
party or that situation or whatever and say, no, I don't want to do that. I already know how I'm going to feel. Or, oh, yeah, I do want to do that because I know how I'll feel. Usually mm-hmm. it's a no <laughs> for my TJs. But sometimes it's a yes. Uh, and it's like, it's a, it's a sense of like, I know myself well enough to know how I'm going to be at that event. And I'm going to predict that my emotions are going to be like this. And, and then they might make behavior change based on that. And I think our encouragement to INJs and INTJs in specific, because that's what we're talking about here, is actually you may not always know how a situation might play out. Maybe there's a surprise. Maybe there's a person that's there that you didn't expect to be there. So that adds another flavor into the situation. Like you don't have all the information yet. You're not in that situation. And are you telling me that you can absolutely predict how your emotions are going to be in any, any situation? I think people that even have really, really, really high emotional intelligence, maybe even feeling dominant types, you know, they have a feeling function, an EFJ or an IFP as their driver cognitive function. I don't even think they're good at knowing how they're going to feel in every situation. So you're telling me you're better at it than even them? <laughs> I don't know. So I, we, we question a lot and we do some work and some people are better at it than others. But this is kind of a, is that really an awareness of self? I mean, it kind of begs the question, is, it, is that in myself, is somebody self-aware, an INTJ that's doing that? Mm. Or are they a self, is that a self appraisal moment that they're having? Are they kind of appraising kind of, it's like an estimate, right? Yeah. It's going to be like I did with the ropes course. So, uh, so let's, should we define our terms? Let's, let's get more clarity. Let's bring some definition here. I I think that's a good idea. So I think self appraisal is a subset of self-awareness. I think, uh, it's, uh, self-awareness is like sort of the category and self appraisal is a, uh, it's an element of self-awareness. Yeah. And um, and I want to use the definition that's found in the book "Emotional Intelligence at Work." the The definition that um, the writer, uh, last name Weisinger, wrote about self appraisal is the different impressions, interpretations, evaluations, and expectations you have about yourself that generally take the form of inner dialogue. Mm. So uh, it's impressions, interpretations, evaluations, and expectations. That's appraising. And when we um, when we believe that we are appraising things well, it's based on the assumption that we have high self-awareness and we know ourselves well enough to make these appraisals and that we're not going to corrupt them in any way that we're just going to know. Now, to be fair, I've worked with quite a few people with INTJ preferences that end up saying that they're actually not that good at predicting. Like and and if they believe they are. It's oftentimes a, you know, every time I've been right, yeah. that now is, you know, that, that that's more um, evidence for confirmation. You know, yeah, confirmation, yeah. How, how I'm good at it. And every time I've been wrong, I don't pay attention, right? I just enjoy my good time and just call myself, uh, call myself lucky. Yeah. So the challenge with those kinds of, you know, those kinds of um, assumptions and uh, the the belief that we're good at those things is one of the major things we have to fight is confirmation bias. We have to fight that when we're wrong, we sweep it under the rug, whether we're aware of it or not. And when we're right, we use it as evidence that, see, I knew that, which is one of the biggest challenges of self-awareness is that we have to be paying attention to the whole thing, yeah. not just not just the times that we're validating what we already thought we knew. And when we do work with I, people with INTJ preferences, a lot of times they when they get out and they don't just follow the assumption, the expectation of this is how I'm going to feel. Oftentimes they go, actually, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm wrong as often as I'm right, if not more often. Yeah. And I think that's, I mean, that's a very, I'm not trying to pick on INTJs. This was a really apt example. Let's pick on them. (laughs) They need to be picked on, right? (laughs) Poor (laughs) INTJs. Poor INTJs. Um, I mean, I think there's probably a version of this for everybody. Like we all have a very, our own version of this and whatever, however it manifests of kind of a self-appraisal that oh. we think we're going to be good at something. Heck yeah. Right? <laughs> we're all, we all have these, these over yes. confident assumptions that we're super good at fill in the blank yeah. knowledge about ourselves. Absolutely. So let me zoom in on what you said. You, you, you're defining it with a lot of this idea of self-talk. It's like kind of having an inner dialogue or self-talk. And so I'm trying to find a real practical way that might show up. So let's say I'm ready to get up onto a stage to give a speech or give a talk or something. And I start to tell myself like, oh my goodness, like I'm going to be so nervous up there. I don't do well in front of large crowds. I'm probably going to miss my line, you know, miss, forget my notes or something. And I'm telling this to myself, I'm trying to appraise my performance that's coming, that's forthcoming. Yeah. Now, 
is that self-aware or not? I, I guess that's still the question. You said it's a subset. You're, you're believing it's a subset of self-awareness. Yeah. So there's a sense of it, but I may be wildly off. I might be accurate. And I also might create a self-fulfilling prophecy. That's the other thing I'm thinking too. Is yeah. I've noticed that when I tell myself one thing, I tend to live up to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's something we also have to count in here. Well, I think that's part of the setting of an expectation. It's like, uh, you know, I'm, uh, um, I'm going to totally botch this presentation or, you know, like I'm, I'm killing it on this date or whatever it is that we're telling ourselves. Yeah. This is our appraisal of how well we're doing, of how well we think we're going to do our assumptions, our interpretations of what's actually going on around us and, you know, and, and how we're showing up in a situation. It, that's the appraisal. The appraisal is like, am I doing well here? Am I not doing well? Am I going to not do well? Am I not going to like it? Am I, am I going to think this, you know, that this is the greatest thing? It's like, these are, these are evaluations we're making based on what we think we know about ourselves. Now, the challenge with any time we're future pacing an expectation is that we have to take into account that the environment may not be as we predict. I'm going to hate this party, so I'm not going to go means that you're not just predicting how you're going to feel. You're predicting the entire party. And while you may have been to parties before, like how many times have you gone to a party where just one person made a total difference? Right. And they were like, I wasn't even invited. I just came with a friend. And then it ends up being like, that, that now they're your BFF for life. I have, I have literally had that happen. That's not a BFF for life, but <laughs> say really, yeah, <laughs> just BFF. You met at a party. And, no, I went to um, I went to a, a party as a teenager, totally expecting it to be super lame, and then ended up meeting my best friend, who was my best friend, you know, for like you know years and years oh, and years. She would have been for life, but she would have been for life. life. Took a different turn. That's right. Had you, you made other choices, so <laughs> that's right. <laughs> had I not had Fair I enough. not made the life choices that I did, um, yes, exactly. She She'd would have still been your friend. Yeah, yeah, she would have been a best friend for okay. life. So uh, those are the kinds of th- and she was she just happened to show up. Like she was she was invited, but she wasn't going to go. And it was like a you know sort of a a friend of a friend and um fair enough yeah it was just incidental and so how many times has that, has that happened so part of appraisal has to take environment into account which is very difficult to predict when we're talking about future things like even if it's a talk you're going to give in 5 minutes you might get up there and then there's just like somebody sitting in the front who's got this huge encouraging supportive smile on their face and then you end up giving your entire talk to them and you kill it right it was wonderful And then you could also go out there and everybody could have a dour face and be looking at their phones and not give two craps. And you could have thought that you're, I'm going to nail this thing. And then it ended up, you know, you know, it was a wet firecracker. Yeah. So, um, so that's a challenge whenever we're talking about appraisals that involve other people. But I think when we talk about self-appraisal, not just in how we're going to perform and behave, but also in interpreting our motivations and intentions yeah. and why we think we're doing what we're doing and um, what it means about ourselves. I think, uh, I think we tend to, or we allow ourselves to get a little shallow in those waters. And um, while we believe we're self-aware, I think there's a lot of material around self-appraisal that can actually amplify our self-awareness. If we, if we go, like we, we penetrate some yeah. of those, you know, more shallow depths. Yeah. It feels like there's a lot of room for like trouble to enter the realm when I have an expectation and things don't live up to my expectation. That's again, I think there's an opportunity here, but I think that's where triggering happens, right? Like I might have an expectation if I go and meet somebody at the, like at a store, a checkout counter of the interaction, I expect them to be friendly or something. And if they're rude to me or, you know, hostile, that very much was not what I was expecting. I was appraising the situation. I was appraising how I was going to show up. I was going to show up all friendly. I've actually had this happen. I think I'm showing up friendly. And then all of a sudden, like somebody's very ag- like aggressive or mean or difficult to interact with. It's like triggering. Like, wh- who do you think you are? You get to just do that, not be friendly. Because I'm being friendly to you. you know, I'm upset about it or something. And I'm getting yeah. triggered. Obviously, that gives me some shadow material to look at. Mm-hmm. But I think that's really where some of the things that we might struggle with, with triggers and feeling really emotionally put off or put out. I think there's this, it's the expectation that we had that we're creating that often creates the suffering or the the problem zone for us. Yeah. Uh, shadow material is definitely the challenge to self-awareness, right? Of because yeah. we're by definition not aware of it. Like that's kind of the point of yeah. it. And so for sure, triggers help communicate those things. And, um, and I think when it comes to uh, 
I, I mean, I think when it comes to self-appraisal, most of the time, while we can have a healthy, I, I guess a healthy self-appraisal, another word would be modest. Yeah. Like we don't assume more of ourselves than we're capable of, but we also don't assume less of ourselves. And this is an area of self-awareness where people oftentimes do fail because they're not acknowledging how hard on themselves they are. I think we almost all tend to, not everybody, but most of us tend to have a lower self-appraisal than we're than we probably have earned. Like the idea that I'm going to bomb this talk or yeah. I can't do this thing because or I'm not going to like it because I've, you know, I mean, I, I know people who are like, well, I, I can't get in a relationship until I get other things. You know, I, I, I get my uh, career handled or vice versa. I can't, you know, I can't move on with my life until I get in a relationship or whatever. It's uh, it's how they're talking to themselves about how they're going to navigate through life. And they're appraising their performance and what they're going to be capable of and and trying to interpret the the impressions that they have about themselves. And almost always it turns negative. And that might be because you're setting a low expectation since it's like a, it feels nicer to have a low expectation and then and then receive a better experience yeah. than what you were expected or expecting to. And I think that this comes from people who are um, who have been disappointed a lot, particularly maybe disappointed in childhood a lot. This is me. I set expectations low. I hate being disappointed. Yeah. Clearly, I, I, I want to set them really low. So I'm not as disappointed. Mm -hmm. Like if I watch my favorite football team, the Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> I go into games assuming they're going to lose. So that way, if they win, I'm happy. But if they lose, I'm like, oh, I already knew it. So that way, it kills out my feeling of suffering or sadness in that. Yeah. I think a lot of people do that for the self. Yes, exactly. I think tons of people do. And they set their expectations low so they can avoid disappointment. The challenge is, like you said, sometimes it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. And so now you're in a spiral down. You appraised low so that you wouldn't be disappointed, but then you manifested your low appraisal. And so maybe you weren't disappointed, but you certainly didn't accomplish what you wanted to. And, uh, and then that just reinforces the behavior. And so now you're on a spiral downward. So what's coming up for me as we talk, and I want to get into some specifics here, what somebody can do to do better self-appraisal or self-aware you know, through their life. But I, I have to make this caveat that you mentioned earlier, this feels I mean, if you, emotional and motivational. Mm -hmm. I immediately think of the cognitive function, the judging cognitive function of authenticity or introverted feeling mm -hmm. used by all FPs in the Myers-Briggs system. I use it as an ENFP. And I think, well, that kind of makes sense, right? Learning motivation, you, we know, comes from emotion. We know that mo emotions are the seat of motivation. It gets us into action. If we feel something, we move on it, we get motivated. And we kind of tether that or tie that as, as type to introverted feeling or authenticity. Are we saying that they, like people like myself that use this as a strength, are going to be better at doing self-evaluation or self-appraisal or awareness more than, let's say, somebody like you, Antonia, who is an ENTP preferences, right? You have ENTP preferences. You don't use introverted feeling or authenticity. I mean, you have it way down in your shadow, but it's not really your tool set. You come in with accuracy or introverted thinking. You're more about the logic and how things line up logically. Mm -hmm. So... How could how can we think about this? Are are is like a bunch of personality types just out of luck? They don't have access to this or very limited access, and so they're not going to have very good self appraisal. Or could we couch it in another way to have that self appraisal? Uh, so uh, having a function as a preferred function doesn't mean we're necessarily uh super skilled. Of course. We trend towards that, but just like we recently did a podcast on the difference between using a function. And tapping into its wisdom. People are very confused by this. Right. And yeah. so I do believe that uh, types that have introverted feeling or authenticity as a preferred function spend more time in their, you know, like kind of in an introspective space about how they feel and what their identity is and what means something to them. Introverted thinking or accuracy is more tapped into, you know, like our thoughts and our our beliefs and what makes sense to us. But I think that that's a big part of the self-assessment or self-appraisal, too, because we're using language to do it. So right. it taps into our beliefs as well. Like, um, like you might get a feeling, like an ominous feeling before you get on stage. But once you put it into articulation, like I'm going to bomb this talk, now we're in belief realm. Yeah. And so introverted thinking or accuracy helps us. Uh, t like, like watch our mind talk to itself, right? Like it watches our own self-articulation. 
So there's, yeah. I think that there's an advantage to that too, because if we're blind to how we're talking to ourselves, then we don't, we might not even be aware of our self appraisal because it's as, you know, as the, the, de- the working definition alluded to, a lot of it is part of inner dialogue. Yeah. So I think it's both. I think it's our intentions and motivations, but it's also how we talk, how we're talking to ourselves yeah. and, and how we're metricizing it to some extent, like, which falls a little bit more in the thinker realm. And I don't think, uh, I mean, that would be implying to some extent that perceiving types automatically have an edge over judging types. Well, they do. I mean, I was going to say this. So judging types have an edge over perceiving types in the outer world. Mm -hmm. They understand how to construct the outer world emotionally or like logically and like structurally Mm -hmm. better than perceivers do. I mean, it's more of a challenge for us. We can do it, but it's harder. It's my tertiary or 10-year-old process of extroverted thinking effectiveness that does that. That's true. And so I was thinking, well, (laughs) well, the reverse would, if it's the inner space, that's true. The two judging functions in the inner space that really tune into the inner space and know what's going on for it are introverted thinking accuracy used by TPs Mm -hmm. or introverted feeling authenticity used by FPs. Yeah. And just like a ETJ will be better at managing external resource, an IFP might be better at managing inner space, like Mm -hmm. inner heart space or motivational self-awareness space. Yeah. Self-assessment. Yeah. So I think that's, I, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I thought, no, actually, I, I really think that that's how I was going to posit that. Could we say that? Can we, can we kind of see it this way? That the inner space, and by the way, all types are going to have access to one of those two judging functions. Mm-hmm. Introverted thinking accuracy, FJs and TPs are going to have it. Now, it may not be a strength, but it's going to be in there. And then introverted feeling is for all TJs and FPs are going to have introverted feeling or authenticity because they come as a polarity set with the mm-hmm. extroverted judging functions. So what do you think about that idea? I know I... I Cut you off to give the idea out, but you can counter it if you thought, uh, if you have a difference of this. No, I think you're right. I think you're onto something. I think that's one of the advantages to being a perceiver type is that we do have a little bit more, well, we have more certainty and confidence when we go inside and yeah. do self-assessment and self-appraisal. We're not as scared of what we're going to find. And we don't, I don't think we're as harsh with ourselves, actually. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, yeah, we can be perfectionists. But we also, like, that might not be as crippling for us as it would be for maybe a judger type that uh, has less certainty there. They're more uncertain and believe that they have to have a standard that might be way higher than what is actually necessary in order to reach bare minimum. So I do think that that is an advantage advantage of a perceiver type. One of the best ways, though, to, to offset uh, or or to counteract low self appraisal, lower than necessary, though, is to seek outer world feedback, is to watch what we've accomplished and done and then recalibrate, right? Like to get that information back. And in that way, I think judges would actually have an edge if they're seeking outer world feedback about what they can do and what they're capable of and the things they've built. Judges would have more of an edge there. But then uh, having proper self-assessment or self-appraisal internally will still be a place of uncertainty. And so um, so it, the feedback might be easier, but they would still have to make that inner determination, yeah. which might be a bit of a challenge. Whereas a perceiver type yeah. might have an easier time of navigating the inner space yeah. and self-assessing in a more realistic way, right, with a higher degree of modesty or certainty. Uh, but they might f- have a harder time getting outer world feedback to calibrate uh, with, if they need to. I mean, in some ways, sometimes perceivers can like think too highly of themselves without having any of the receipts, you know, like <laughs> I've, I've struggled with that. Too. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I'm the greatest blah, 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 blah. And it's like, and the evidence is where, and it's like, well, I'll get to that. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's still being built. Yeah. Right? It's come later. That's what I say. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, are Joel and Antonio right now saying that perceivers are really good at self-assessment and and self-awareness and judges aren't and they're better at the external no everybody can do all of this mm-hmm. we're just talking about trends and we're talking about maybe who's more equipped for it, who has the tools for it who's probably likely to clock more hours there and kind of who would be equipped in that domain and i i think you're absolutely right judge judges in the outside world perceivers in the inside world in that framework and you know most once it kicks out the outside world i think judges can definitely they have better measurements mm-hmm. right they just they have better measurements than us perceivers do in the outer world yeah we can never meet their measurements being on time <laughs> <laughs> being organized you know all their measurements they have okay so let's let's see if we can get some practicality around here so we talked a little bit about the philosophy we kind of set this all up 
this really isn't a topic where we apply it to every single one of the 16 types. That's not really appropriate here. This is more principle-based. We're giving ingredients for you to triangulate this with your personality type, right? And use some self-judgment and self-awareness on your own side to take what we're talking about today to weave this into your own experience. So as we drive down for something more practical, something that somebody that's watching or listening right now could take away from this episode, let's get into that. How, how can we be thinking about it? And then what can we actually do about it? Well, anytime I, I think that anytime we're talking about self-awareness, one of the leverage points is to be really aware of our coping mechanisms. Oh, self-awareness or self-appraisal? Uh, let's talk about self-appraisal in the context of, I mean, the category is self-awareness. Okay, I just want to make sure I'm following. Yeah. So when I say anytime we're talking about the category of self-awareness, okay. we always need to be aware of coping mechanisms. Coping mechanisms are birthed from cognitive dissonance, meaning that um, anytime our brain doesn't want to acknowledge or see a part of ourselves that we've, in Carl Jung's terms, dis, or Jungian terms, disowned. So parts of ourselves that we're not ready to make peace with yeah. for whatever reason, uh, then that creates a schism inside of ourselves. And the only way to deal with those schisms is to have coping mechanisms. Things And, and triggers you know, can be a version of a coping mechanism. So uh, awareness requires us to pay attention to coping mechanisms. And coping mechanisms are like ways to self-soothe when something needs attention, but we don't, for whatever reason, we're not paying it attention inside of ourselves, right? Some part of us is like kind of tugging at our pant leg and going like, hey, I, I think I, I think I have, uh, you, you got to acknowledge me or I have some needs or, you know, like pay attention to me. And we're like, no, I'm, I, I don't have time. I have to go to work and I can't sit here and, re, you know, talk about my past or whatever. So, and whenever we have a disowned part, it creates a schism inside of ourselves. And the only way to, you know, show up as a productive member of society when we are schismed is to, to have behaviors that cover over some of these, you know, some, some of these schisms. And those are coping mechanisms. So when we talk about self-appraisal, a major thing to pay attention to is how many of your appraisals are coping mechanisms. Yeah. Right? Like, like. Before you go do something scary, talking about how you're going to fail. That's actually a coping mechanism. It's not a very nice one. But, you know, not wanting to be disappointed because you've been disappointed so much in the past and you just don't want to be disappointed anymore. So you're always going to have super low expectations. That's a coping mechanism, right? And so paying attention to how your brain is helping you navigate through life. It's like yeah. it's, it's trying to be with you. It's trying to support you. It's trying yes. to like have your back. It doesn't know that these are counterintuitive or in a counterintuitive way, they're actually harming you. So uh, watching those coping mechanisms, I think, is the number one thing. And the best way to know is, uh, am I not, is the, is the result not following the intended, you know, behavior? It's like I started this thing. Uh, I, I want to not feel disappointed. So I'm going to tell myself it's all going to be bad. And then when it's bad, did I actually abate disappointment or am I actually still feeling disappointed? Yeah. Uh, it's just now, now I'm also kind of cynical on top of it. The, so this is actually important. I don't want to go, we don't have to go too deep here. But again, when we're working with clients in like a, per, a personality life path mentorship program, or even the program that comes after that life path coaching, where we're helping people, you know, longer term, this idea of complexes comes up a lot. And I think this is where we're in a coping mechanism. We can create complex around it like we get so locked in with something that we kind of can't let go of it anymore yeah uh well it's actually in reverse the complex creates the coping mechanism yeah yeah, yeah. and um and just to, i mean the work is is getting both those <laughs> loosened in a, in a person that's right to not have that running them yeah and not to go too deep this is uh this is actually quite a bit of content that um we go through in like personality dynamics which is a program that follows personality life path or profile training. But in personality dynamics, um, I, I, we actually just covered this in one of the classes that uh, a complex is, um, in Jungian terms, it's a, an archetype or another word is image. So uh, an image is basically whatever your personal representation for an idea is. Yeah. So, and that's what an archetype is to some extent too. It's like, that's the picture I have in my head when I think about the subject. So guardian angel. Mm -hmm. I don't know what image comes to my head when I think of guardian angel. Right. Right. That's like an archetype of a guardian angel. And then I have something I picture in my, my brain. Yeah. Or you could even go much less specific. You could say protection. Okay. Right. Like I'm protected. 
maybe is, a shield, an image of a shield or or a guardian angel or a guardian or angel, a police right? officer mm-hmm. or a, That's a right. wall or some kind of a door bolt lock, mm-hmm. like whatever image comes to your brain or thought. Yep. That's the archetype representation. That's right. It's at the center. And then a, what a complex is, is it's all the unprocessed material that surrounds that image around that subject. So unprocessed material is like our memories, our feelings, our thoughts, our beliefs, and um, our patterns, meanings, interpretations, and our wishes. Yeah. So it's, I mean, if you're going to look at it in type terms, you could almost say our introverted sensing or memory, our introverted thinking accuracy, our introverted feeling authenticity, and our introverted intuition or perspectives. So it's whatever is unprocessed in all of that that um, is surrounding the the central image, which is based on a, a topic or a theme. Now, we're all made up of complexes, like all of us. Like, in fact, uh, one could argue that the, the backbone of our personality, 100% of human beings have, like, say, a mother complex because we all have an image in our head of what a mother is. And we all have unprocessed material around the concept of mother. So all of us have a complex. But a complex isn't a problem until it starts throttling action. It starts disrupting your life. And so once it starts disrupting your life and, um, and now the complex is kind of taking over, right? It's like, I can't do that because, and then, it, and then you source it back and it ends up being attached to some sort of, you know, like theme or topic. Uh, that's when a complex is a problem. So yeah. what ends up happening is when we have a complex and we have this unprocessed material, we end up having a schism, right? Because it's, we're, we're, we're disowning parts of ourselves in favor of this complex. There's a bunch of, it's, 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 it's encouraging us to behave in ways that are going contrary to a healthy psyche, basically. And so uh, in order to deal with all the other parts that have to be marginalized in order for this, com- this part of our personality, this complex to, you know, to, to have outsized power and control over our choices, et cetera, we end up creating coping mechanisms. And the coping mechanisms are intended to kind of tamp down some of the neuroticism that is coming up for us. Neuroticism basically being all the weird behaviors we do yeah. that aren't full on, you know, psychotic or anything. It's not like we're crazy people that can't interact with society. We're, we're just a little off, offbeat. And so the coping mechanisms are an attempt to kind of tamp down some of the neuroticism that comes up whenever we're dealing with a complex with outsized power. Yeah. So um, that's, that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> so when we're doing self-appraisal, we have to be aware of some of those, those elements of our personality that have outsized power and, and how they're influence, influencing us to appraise ourselves, right? Because they're, they, they end up, in order to be okay with, you know, some of this, um, some of these, these parts of ourselves that have to go in the, have to kind of be edged out in order for this thing to encourage so much, you know, of our, of our response. Yeah. Then, um, yeah. And then that, that means that we're by definition, not accurately self-appraising because the parts of ourselves that have something to say might not be listened to at all in favor of this part that has this really big, you know, a kind of overwhelming voice. Yeah. So I think if we want to get tangible about this, and by the way, thank you for running through the complex thing. I think that is, first of all, I think it's interesting. And I think it's also useful to have that in, in, like the, in your mind as a framework. As we talk about some of the actions or practical things, kind of know what's going on behind the curtain. Like this is probably running all the time. Let's talk about some practical things to do. I think one of the things that I'm tuning into right now is really paying attention to that Mm self-talk. Like joining in that dialogue, I think most of it's automatic for us. We could be way more mindful of that. Okay, what is the actual conversation in my head? And now some people, I would report, I don't have a lot of conversations in my head. I mean, I do, but they're more like impressions and feelings and kind of this, it's less like a, a really explicit conversation. It's more like I might imagine like a performative element or a little scene, like a little movie scene that's going and I'm acting something out. Like my self-talk and dialogue is different than just digital words back and forth. And I would guess that a lot of people have dialogue, like self-talk dialogue in maybe fragments. It's not as clear as it may be to you. Somebody uses like accuracy, introverted thinking. Mm. Um, I know my mom has, she's an INFJ and she does a lot of 
like she'll be like in the grocery store like talking to herself like <laughs> what do i need for dinner today like she'll like have this like actually like out loud to herself she'll be talking to herself so i think it's very indicative of introverted thinking it's super weird to me that people don't yeah <laughs> when i found out that not everybody has constant dialogue going on in their head uh, i was i was like really well how do they do anything <laughs> I, I start talking to myself as soon as i know there's an audience all right like, as soon as somebody else comes in the aisle i start talking to myself but it's right. not for me yeah it's to perform yeah so it's all performative for right. me i don't think i have that dialogue in the same way now clearly something's going on there i am having some inner dialogue or mm -hmm. some inner conversation i'll call it maybe it's not clear dialogue but something is going back and forth with two elements of me or multiple elements of me but it's more emotional it's more performative and it's it's definitely not conversational but i would think that's a very good practical step is just pay attention when yeah. you have that self-talk maybe you can write some phrases down like i'm terrible at this or mm -hmm. i'll i'll bomb terribly if i get on that stage or even if you're assessing yourself like you're watching something that you wish you could do and the self-talk comes in like oh, i wish i could give a talk like that i see on that video mm -hmm. Oh, I'd never be good at that. Oh, wait, I can catch that. Write it down. I'll never be good at that. That's yep. good to catch those moments of self-talk where you're you're limiting yourself. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. that that's I think just kind of a baseline I would argue for self-appraisal. Yeah. Well, and pay, paying attention to the way you're talking to yourself, especially especially if you're talking to yourself in a way that you wouldn't talk to anybody else. Yeah. Right? Like if you're saying things to yourself that are if you said them to anyone else, they would be considered undermining or deeply disrespectful. Pay attention to those kinds, that kind of self-talk for sure. Yeah. And, uh, and then trace it back to, I mean, not that you, I know that we just did an overview of Jungian complexes. Um, and most of that work is done with actually analysts and, uh, and maybe psychiatrists or psychologists or therapists that are aware of it. I'm not, I'm not saying that like, you know, and use your self-talk to dive into all of your deep Jungian complexes, but uh, like kind of source it back and go, well, why, what exactly is going on for me? Wh when I, when I tell myself nothing's going to work out in all the variety of ways that I say that, and I, I've used this example a couple different times, but I think it's a good one. Is it because I'm trying to avoid disappointment? Okay. That's interesting. Why am I trying to avoid disappointment? It's probably because you have a lot of unprocessed disappointment inside, right? Like, like when we have had too much of something, we can't handle any more. It's like a bruise mm -hmm. or a wound on your body. Yeah. You to protect it. Yeah, it's like the emotional version of the straw that broke the camel's back. It's like I can't have one more little bit of this because just that'll just that'll be a bridge too far. It's just it'll send me over the moon. So if you can't handle a specific emotion, it might be because you have too much of that backlogged to process already. So if you are setting up your life or setting up your self-talk in order to avoid certain emotions, like go, well, maybe I have some unprocessed, you know, business here. Yeah. And then figure out methodologies to process emotions, particularly ones that you're not a big fan of, right? Disappointment is a hard one for a lot of people. Um, a mind's anxiety. I'll do just about anything to not feel anxious. But that means that I have certain appraisals of myself that prevent me from being in situations that will create anxiety. So I have to recognize, well, then that means that part of me is being disowned and that means that I have a schism and that means that I'm going to have a coping mechanism. So how much of your talk is a coping mechanism to avoid things that are, you know, that, that are, feel like they'll just add to a backlog of unprocessed material? Okay, I have one of these mm -hmm. that's come up recently, just to workshop this for a second. So it actually being aware of it now made it worse. Now I'm like reinforcing it. Right. So that's, <laughs> Never it, mind. Don't be self-aware. Well, but what I, mean is, what I mean is there must be more here. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Because <laughs> ENFP preferences. I have effectiveness, uh, extroverted thinking as a 10-year-old or tertiary process. And so I might be on a timeline of getting things done. And I noticed, I mean, I had this awareness in the last few months that the moment a time clock is introduced to a situation. Like, I'm pretty good at this function. Like, of course, I think I'm better at it than I am because everybody <laughs> does. Me too. But I have a lot of capacity here. I've spent a lot of time here. So I'm uncertain. I'm not as good as I think I am. But I do have capacity. Like, I know how to do marketing and build business and get stuff done and manage a calendar and resource and pay my bills on time. Like, I, I can do a lot with it that's basic stuff. And I can do some little bit more advanced things with it until you introduce a time clock. And I used to hate this in school. The moment a test was timed, I... Like it's somebody takes an eraser and just wipes my brain or sends a signal and scrambles the signal. The moment I have a ticking time behind me, I get anxious. I can't think clear. 
I don't know if it's going to be okay. Like, uh, like even arbitrary time. So it don't just, hire you for the bomb squad. Yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> just disrupts my entire thing. Now, if it's just one thing, like it's an emergency like that, I probably could because I have to just focus on one thing. It's when it's like a, I'm managing multiple things going on at the same time. That's like really hard. Or a test. Because oh. how, good, how competent <laughs> are you? I guess those are two things. So this came up where I started, I found that out about myself, identified that that was driving me. And now I have that, like, we'll be here and like, we'll have like, our daughter's got to go to an appointment or something. We're trying to finish up a podcast and I'm reminded of the time and I'm like, oh, that's right. I don't do well when the time clock's introduced. And I say that to myself because I know that was what was happening. And then I just buy what I said to myself. I'm like, well, I just, I can't do it with a time clock introduced. And then I get all frustrated and Nothing's really changed except now you know it. <laughs> like, it's all out in the open, but it's still the same problem or the same challenge. Mm-hmm. I haven't actually corrected for it, but I have paid attention to my self talk and now I know what is causing the distress. Yeah. So that's probably like a first step to kind of, I'm appraising, oh, my self appraisal is if I get to that situation or that situation is going to have a time clock on it, self appraisal, I'm probably going to have a very challenging time. I might fall apart. It might be really bu- tough on me. Now, again, I'm, I'm a little bit hyperbolically. Amping this up, I don't think it's a as, little bit. <laughs> in our but, events, our events were under a high time pressure, and I do pretty good. Oh, there. you do beautifully so, there. So I don't yeah. think it's in all circumstances, no, but in, no, no, no. in a lot of ways, it is. Yeah. So no, when you're in a flow state, you are like you're smooth. Fair enough. You're smooth, critical. Anyway, I, I just wanted to introduce that to say sometimes. Okay, oh, we're paying attention to like our appraisal, our self talk. I don't mean to throw us off track, but I just realized that comes up for me like, oh, now I'm reinforcing the thing. Well, and I think that's a good point and why you don't stop with just be aware. Exactly. Like you can't just be aware because like you said, sometimes just being aware actually exacerbates it because now it's a now it's a thing. Right now it's like, oh, God. And and then the anxiety isn't just the subject. The anxiety is your awareness of how you're responding to the subject. So now it's compounded, right? Now you've got like two layers of anxiety going on or two layers of whatever going on. And so that's why the important thing is to source it back to whatever is unprocessed. Yeah. And um, there's a, it's almost like plaque that builds up, I think sometimes, right? Like our unprocessed material can end up becoming uh, like too, like it's, it, it's heavy, right? It feels like, um, it feels like a x-ray vest sitting on us. And we just can't take any more weight. And so when something that isn't that heavy gets added to us, it, it's just too much. And people will look at you and be like, that's not that big of a deal. That's not that heavy. But they're not recognizing all of the weight that you're already carrying underneath it. Yeah. Because that's all personal. It's all baggage from, you know, something, something from the past or something that just needs attention. So um, and, and not to workshop your situation or, you know, the experience you have with the time clock, but there is unprocessed material around that. Yes. And so I don't know if it's memories. I don't know if it's ex- experiences that you haven't fully processed. I don't know if it's beliefs. I don't know if it's feelings. I don't even know if it's or patterns or interpretations or wishes. Uh, it's it's un- but I do know it's unprocessed yeah. because you because in those moments you can't control your response. And so um, so then it's a uh, it whenever we have choice removed from us, whenever we don't have the ability to make a decision of how we're going to show up, it just auto, it goes into autopilot. Yeah. We have to, and especially if it's a, um, if it's something that's not serving us, we have to imagine that, uh, that there's, there is a part of us that needs attention. And, uh, and so in the self, what's nice about self appraisal is it gives a, it gives us an opportunity to hear ourselves talk to ourselves or to show up in those ways or to, you know, to observe our behaviors or our self-talk. And then, and then here's the important thing in a quiet moment, right? It's the important thing because one, if we try to figure it out while we're still all spun up and heated, we're not going to get anywhere, yeah. right? It's just it, the, the thing has already gripped us. So it's just going to keep gripping us and it's going it, to, all, all it'll do is rationalize itself and we won't get any further. So we wait until a quiet moment. And the second reason why that's important is um, uh, we tend to forget after the moment is over. So we go, uh, we go oh, I, I don't know what that was. And then we just move on. But w- when things aren't spun up, when they aren't in the depths of despair or whatever it is that we're go- is going on for us, uh, that's, that is the best time to do actual real legit self-appraisal. And, um, and to, and to figure out what's actually happening with us. But we almost always 
I mean, it's like, well, no, this is a good moment. Why would I want to spend, why would I want to spend my off time doing yeah. self-work? <laughs> yeah. And so, um, so paying attention to those things and then somehow having a mechanism of noting, right? Like, uh, like writing it down or asking somebody that's there, like, how, can you remind me? And maybe even having a mnemonic, like one word, like, can you just remember, remind me to think about time clock later or whatever? Yeah. And so in a, in a time period where you're more resourced, then you can go find out whatever is the, is the unprocessed material. You know, one of the challenges that, like when that example I gave about the time clock, I think one of the big things is I believe it. Mm -hmm. Like it's hard not to believe it, that it disrupts me and it scrambles my brain. And the more I, I call it and I label it and I'm aware of it and I'm appraising it, like it's kind of reinforcing it. So I almost, I need to kind of, now that I have made it aware, I need to kind of, well, it's very subjective, I guess. It's a very subjective experience for me. I think I need to, maybe not everybody would need to do this, but I need to like disengage from the self-talk mm -hmm. for a moment around this. Now that I've identified, it's like now not keep bringing up into my consciousness and reinforcing it. Yeah. So I think that's a big, big thing is it's not going to be a one size fits all. As we appraise ourselves, as we're doing self-awareness, it's going to be very unique to you listening or watching based on how you're like just your general wiring as a person, your circumstance, all that, and then also your personality type. Mm -hmm. Those are going to influence how you experience this of the self. I think that's a really important point, actually, that it's subjective. Like your self-talk or your self-appraisal, it's not like your inner voice. It's not like it's representing reality or the universe. <laughs> it's God himself. Yeah. To you. <laughs> like I'm going to bomb this talk. Is not like God telling you, you know, yeah. or the universe telling you that you're going to bomb the talk or whatever. Um, so I think that's a really important thing to remember is that it's subjective. And because it's subjective, it's it's subject to change. Mm -hmm. Like we can change our self appraisal. We can change our self talk. We can change how we experience ourselves. And um, and I'm not necessarily advocating for always having an opposite response that all of your self-talk or self-appraisal will be positive because that wouldn't be realistic either. Yeah. What you're really looking for is you're looking for modesty. You're looking for, uh, you know, an accurate self-assessment. And um, and I think it's perfectly valid to have a self-talk that is less like I'm going to bomb this talk. Uh, or this speech or presentation or whatever, and to instead say something like, um, I'm, I, I, I'm feeling scared in this moment, but I'm going to do it anyway, right? Like, or like, I'm uncertain about how this presentation is going to go. It's more accurate. Mm -hmm. It's more precise. Yeah. What's really going on for you. Yeah, I'm nervous. I'm, I, I, I don't feel as confident in this moment as I oftentimes do, but I'm going to try it anyway. Yeah. That's a totally reasonable self-appraisal, right? That's e-priming it. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we don't have time to talk about E-Prime. But, but define look, it quickly. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know if I can define it, but basically look this up on Wikipedia, E-Prime. Uh, it's basically creating a very, uh, or it's removing, um, uh, oh, what's the, I don't remember. Anyway, the point is it's radical subjectivity. You're yeah. basically putting it from your, it's like, that movie was terrible. It's, I thought that movie was terrible. Right. right? You're just framing, I can't remember the exact definition. I'll have to look it up. All right, sorry. No, I can't remember. I no, didn't okay. mean to throw a definition in your Joel, direction. pull out some information and <laughs> definitions that's not your strong suit. Right now, on live on air, go. And I'm going to I'm gonna grab a stopwatch. Okay, yes, grab a stopwatch and time me doing it. Like, eh, brain <laughs> gridlocks. Yeah. All right, yeah. so, But okay. that is it. It's like, a, it's like rewording things to make them yeah. as subjective as they actually are and removing the objectivity. Like, that movie sucks. That's an objective statement that actually isn't actually, I mean, that's not actually true. Yeah. I think that movie st sucks is a subjective statement and goes to e -prom. Yeah. So, um, so turning things more personal and making it so that, yeah, like you just said, which is, um, you know, like, uh, like, like kind of trying to call the situation as close to how it actually is being experienced and not laying on all this interpretation of what it means. Right. Um, and then, uh, and, and being, being okay with not, not always, you know, hitting straight A's or the center of the bullseye or whatever. It's like kind of, you know, it's, it's okay to self-appraise with, as I mentioned, with modesty and to be okay with things being a little, you know, imperfect. Yeah. Like it's okay. It's all right. Yeah. Like, uh, I'm going to bomb this presentation. Isn't helpful. I feel nervous. I'm not as confident in this presentation, but I'm going to do it anyway. It's totally fine without the end was like, yeah, no, I bombed that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because that's going to happen sometimes and be like, 
yeah, I was nervous and I guess I had a right to be because I didn't do very well is better than I'm going to bomb this presentation. And then later on wondering if you talked yourself into bombing it. Yeah. Right. And then, and then at that point when you're self-assessing in retrospect, as opposed to future projection, you go, okay, I didn't do that great. I bombed it. Maybe next time I can be more prepared or like, and work through the, all the feelings of it. Okay. I am, I am experiencing humiliation. I'm experiencing maybe even some shame. I'm experiencing fear that bombing the presentation, what it might mean for my career. Like I'm, I'm experiencing all this stuff and like sitting with it and getting to the other side, as opposed to shutting it down, locking it away, having even more disowned stuff, creating a complex around it or whatever, like just being with the experience, getting to the other side, realizing you survived and then getting a sense of, well, what can I do now to not bomb my next presentation? Yeah. Right. Like, what do I got to do? And I, and this is actually a more empowered place because you're going to watch yourself improve over time as opposed to feeling like you're cursed or whatever it is that your self-appraisal then manifests in order to justify why these things aren't going right. Yeah. Okay. So tuning into self-appraisal, self-awareness, you've been listening or watching with us and myself and Antonio have had a microphone. You haven't had a microphone because we recorded this before you heard it. <laughs> So, <laughs> but now Hello, it's from the past. <laughs> from the past. So, uh, but we do want to hear what you have to say about this or think about this because I think as we talk about it, everybody's going to be different and you're going to have a different opinion than me and Antonia, a different perspective, different life experience. So, come over to personalityhacker.com and I, I think we're really curious to hear what, what is your relationship to self appraisal? What is your relationship to how good you are at that versus self awareness? I mean, are you pretty good at knowing what your self-talk and motivations are? Are you more tuned into the impact in the outer world? I, you know, we kind of bi bifurcated this between judger and perceiver a little bit, mm -hmm. just as a, as a loose concept. Again, it's not a rule, just trends, some things that can happen. Well, and I do want to make a statement that um, in the same way that perceivers can actually become quite accomplished in the outside world and get a lot done and make a lot of things happen. I don't believe it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Other perceivers, not us. <laughs> um, but just like perceivers can do that. Yes. Judgers can also have a very like good relationship to self and do well with self-awareness and self-appraisal specifically. Absolutely. Because I think self-awareness isn't just the two introverted judging functions. No. I think they're also the two introverted perceiving functions, yep. right? Like there's a lot of different styles of things that we can process internally. And so um, it's not, it, 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 we're more talking about self-evaluation, not yeah. necessarily self-awareness as a, as a top category subject. I think judges can be just as self-aware as perceivers because they have they have introverted functions too that they prefer. It's just not the appraising one. And I that is a really key distinction here to make sure no one missed this, that we're not talking about somebody's value or worth. Mm -mm. Appraisal, not like a house on the market for sale. Like how right. much is this worth in a marketing way or in a transactional way? Yeah. Like not self-worth. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about appraising of like how you're going to be in a situation, like self-appraisal of your responses. Yeah, your expectations for yourself. Yes. and Make sure yeah. that was clear. Yeah. Uh, so again, I want to invite you to come over and ask a question, make a comment, share your story. I think stories about your relationship, these kinds of things. Maybe you had a, maybe you have something like I had where you had an awareness that there's an element that's introduced at some point, changes the situation, and you became aware of it. You tuned into self-talk. Maybe you're able to overcome that. You can give me some advice if you have a time clock situation like I do. I'd love to hear it. Um, but I think this could be a really great conversation to start. So directly below this podcast, you can leave a comment, ask a question, or share your story. And uh, over at Personality Hacker is the best place to do that. I also recommend that if you're really wanting to dial in for yourself, uh, your personality type, and then being able to do things like appraise well, and once you do get leverage on yourself and grow yourself, our personality owner's manuals. We have one for all the 16 types in the Myers-Briggs system. They're fantastic. Of course, I'm going to say that, but I really stand by it. I think they're really good tools. They come along in your, in your life and they can help you understand all sorts of things like trauma looping, how you get stuck in grips, how to set up your life ergonomically, how to grow, how to have the part of you that can translate between the weaker parts and the stronger parts, how you can have that talking and translating between those two parts of you so you get a better experience in life. And also tune into things like career, relationship, personal growth, worldview, all of this stuff, self-identity. So I recommend going over to Personality Hacker and grabbing an owner's manual for your type. Yep. Uh, so I'm going to try to do this ending, okay. Joel, without you making fun of me for it. Because before we started the podcast, you I'm going to praise that you're going to do great. You made fun of me, but I'm just going to, I'm going to self-appraise and say, I'm a little nervous. Okay. 
about doing this ending and nailing it, it. but I'm going to do it and I'm going to try anyway. Here we go. All right. If you enjoyed the podcast, you can subscribe to us on many different platforms, including Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, and a bunch of others, a bunch of Android platforms. And if you would leave us a rating and review at whatever app allows you to, uh, the number one that I've noticed is Apple Podcasts. So if you leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, that would make me very happy. The review is the important part, actually. Uh, Because then I get to read your feedback and know that people are actually listening and then it fuels me and we keep going. Because uh, Joel will do the podcast for eternity, but I don't know if I will. (laughs) So I need that sweet, sweet validation, you know, just hook it to my veins and then I'll, then maybe I'll show up next week. I don't know. We'll see. It all depends on you and your review. How was that? And then as Joel mentioned, you can get an owner's manual for your personality type. I highly recommend it. Uh, they're tailored to your type and um, they go over not just the stuff that ta- uh, Joel was talking about, but I also think they discuss some of the common challenges yeah. of people of your personality type. And it's kind of just nice to know I'm not alone. There are other people like me. There are dozens of us, literally dozens. And so uh, so head over to personalityhacker.com to grab an owner's manual as well. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we'll talk with you on the next Personality Hacker podcast. How was it? Did I do okay? You did great. <laughs>